last class we have discussed about enthalpy change for different phase transitions means we are studying the subject called thermochemistry in thermochemistry we have to discuss one uh, one summation law that is called hess's law of summation of constant heat hess's law is conceived by swiss born russian chemist henry jarnet henry s so hess's law of constant heat of summation was published in the year of 1840 
unit of first law of thermodynamics. So we can only calculate the enthalpy change by algebraic summation or algebraic procedure. So Hess's law allows the enthalpy change delta H for a reaction to be calculated if and when it cannot be measured experimentally. This is accomplished by performing basic algebraic operations based on the chemical equation of the reactions using previously determined values for the enthalpies of formation. Addition of chemical equation leads to a net overall equation. If enthalpy change is known for each reaction and the result is the enthalpy change for the net equation If the net enthalpy change delta H net is that is less than zero, the reaction is exothermic, and if it is that means heat produced to the system, it's heat producing reaction. If delta H is positive, the value, the reaction is endothermic, this heat absorbed. Hess's law states that enthalpy changes are additive, thus delta H for a single reaction is delta H reaction is equal to summation of delta H product formation minus delta H reactant formation. So the terms, the terms standard state is actually shown by this superscript refers to the standard thermodynamic condition chosen for the substance when listing a company uh, listing or comparing the thermodynamic data, one atmosphere pressure and specified temperature usually at 25 degrees centigrade. So where zero is the superscript. Now examples of Hess's law. So if a chemical reaction A plus B for a product C and C when it reacts with A it forms D plus B. So what is the overall reaction? So we can calculate 
okay, in healthy change of reaction 3 by only summation of these two reactions, 1 and 2. And in this case, C is the intermediate. It is not participating, it is not found in the overall reaction. So now for the example of Hess's law. We can calculate when carbon reacts with carbon, oxygen to form carbon dioxide, the value the enthalpy changes minus 393.5 kJ. How we can calculate this? By this procedure, we can calculate this. So from book we get carbon with incomplete um, combustion. Carbon in incomplete combustion it forms carbon monoxide. This is an incomplete form, uh, combustion molecule. Combustion means of, uh, burning in presence of excess of oxygen. It forms carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide reacts with half molecule of oxygen to form carbon dioxide. This is the complete reaction. If we know the enthalpy change for this individual two reaction, we can calculate the total enthalpy change for this next reaction, carbon dioxide formation reaction. So the net by algebraic summation, we get carbon plus carbon monoxide plus oxygen. One mole of carbon reacts with one mole of carbon dioxide and one mole of oxygen to form one mole of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. This is only summation. But by counterbalancing carbon monoxide is present, both the side, right hand side and left hand side of the reaction, reaction so we counterbalance each other and we get the net reaction carbon plus oxygen to form carbon dioxide. So this is the basic principle, basic example, a very simple example of Hess's law of constant heat of summation. Now next example. Suppose you are given the following data. Sulfur reacts with oxygen to form sulfur dioxide. Delta H is minus 297 kJ. And sulfur trioxide reacts with sulfur dioxide to form oxygen. It is given to you. So now could you, could you use this data to obtain the enthalpy change for the following reaction? Sulfur plus oxygen to form sulfur trioxide. We have to calculate the net enthalpy change for these reaction by using these two data. How we can do this? By simple way. So this delta H1 
we have to multiply by 2 delta h 2 we have to multiply by using minus 1 is the minus 1 we have to multiply by minus 1 so if we multiply the first equation by 2 and reverse the second equation they will sum up together to become the third So this is the minus. So by first equation we have multiplied by 2 and second equation we reversed it and we found that this is the final value by summation. Now what are the applications of Hess's law? Hess's law of constant heat of summation is useful in the determination of enthalpies of the following. Number one, it is a very good assumption. Okay. Number one, it here's a very slow reaction we can calculate by using Hess's law. Number two, heat of formation of unstable intermediates like carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, which we can we can't calculate the heat of formation for these unstable intermediates because they are not formed in nature. They actually react further to form a more stable product like carbon monoxide reacts with oxygen further to form carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is more stable than carbon monoxide. Heat change in phase transition and allotropic transition we can calculate using Hess's law. So Lappi's energy of ionic substances by constructing bond have a cycle that is another type of hypothetical cycle if the electron affinity to form the anion is known so we can calculate the lattice energy using this Hess's law of constant heat of summation by drawing the bond have a cycle that is the another hypothetical cycle and electron affinity also calculated through bond have a cycle so this theoretical term which are very important for uh, different ion compounds and uh, electron affinity for elements, these can be calculated using this summation procedure. This is very simple, only as enthalpy is a state function, we can calculate the net enthalpy change by using algebraic operating operation because enthalpy is state function, it is independent of the path followed. So next, we are discussing heat capacity. What is this? This is a frying pan or saucepan.
So heat required to warm up the oil in this pan is less than the heat required to warm up the water in this pan. So that means heat capacity is the, this is the heat capacity of oil is different than heat capacity of water. So what is heat capacity? Heat capacity, specific heat capacity can be thought of as a measure of how much heat energy is needed to warm the substance up. So you will possibly have noticed that it is easier to warm up the saucepan full of oil than it is warm up the substance full of water. So why? So what is specific heat capacity? Specific heat capacity of a substance is the amount of it required to raise the temperature of 1 gram of the substance by 1 degree centigrade or 1 Kelvin. So it is specific heat capacity Constant 
and volume is called V. Cv. So Cv is del Q by del T at constant V. So these are Cp and Cv. So at constant pressure Q, Q is the heat absorbed and it is the path function. For that reason we are showing it as small. So del Q at constant pressure we can write del H by del T at constant rate P. Q P is equal to H. We have discussed it in the previous classes. And del Q at constant V it is called E. Del E by del T at constant V.
Santi. Del ki by del ki at constant p plus p del v by del t at constant p. This is the thing. This is equation three. This is equation two. by 
by del T V. So this is the equation. Equation number is 5. This is the equation number 6. Sorry. This is the equation number 6. So comparing the equation 4 and equation 6. This is equation 4. This is 5. So comparing equation 4 and 6. 4 and 6. So we can replace the value of del E by del T P by this value. So we get Cp minus Cp is equal to del E del V T del V del T P plus del E del T V plus P del V del T P minus del E del T V. So these two are counterbalancing each other. So we get del E by del V T del V by del T P plus P del V by del T P. So we get this. So this is the equation A7. Sorry, this is the equation 7. This is the equation 7. Now one thing we have to discuss. We are actually calculating or we are trying to establish the relation of Cp minus Cp for ideal gases. So in case of ideal gases, this term del E by del V T is zero. How? So the term del E by del V T represents the change in internal energy with change in volume at constant temperature. It is measure of interaction between the molecules. So it is the expansion or compression. So for ideal gases, actually there is no interaction between the molecule. For that reason, del E by del V T is equal to zero. So this term is equal to zero for ideal gases. And we get that Cp minus Cv is equal to P del by del T P. So this term del E by del V T is equal to 0. So equation 7 reduces to this. P del V by del T P. This is equation 8. This is equation 8. Cp minus Cv is equal to P del V by del T P.
to 1. That means 1 mole of ideal gas is present. So when A is equal to 1, Pv is equal to Rt. So V by T is equal to R by P. So V is equal to or V is equal to R T by P. Then del V by del T at constant P is equal to R by P. Putting this value, this is so del V by del T P is equal to R by P. Then putting this value in equation 8, we get that P into R by P. So it is equal to Cp minus Cv is equal to R for ideal gases. Cp minus Cv is equal to R for ideal gases. Del V by del P, P is equal to R by P. So Cp minus Cv is equal to R. But for non-ideal gases, as the equation of state is not this, but for non-ideal gases, this is for ideal gases. But for non-ideal gases, Cp minus Cv is not equal to R. Cp minus Cv is not equal to R. This relation holds good only for ideal gases. For non-ideal gases, Cp minus Cv is not equal to R. So this is the heat capacity. Now we will start second law of thermodynamics. So what is the first law of thermodynamics? The first law of thermodynamics tells us about the conservation of energy. But this first law actually doesn't tell about the direction of energy transfer and for that reason only second law of thermodynamics actually conceived. Energy can be, this is the statement by Julius Robert Vaughan and Meyer. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. That means this is called the first law of thermodynamics is conservation of total energy. But it doesn't tell about, it says nothing about the direction of energy transfer. So what is the statement of second law of thermodynamics? The entropy of an isolated system increases in any reversible processes and is unaltered in any reversible processes. So entropy, another term, a thermodynamic quantity or another term, term is called from second law of thermodynamics. The entropy, the entropy of an isolated system increases in any irreversible processes and is unaltered in any reversible process. Okay? So, second law sometimes actually called the principle of increasing entropy. The entropy actually shown by delta S. So, second law is called the principle of increasing entropy. So delta S is greater than zero for any irreversible process and is equal to zero for any reversible process. So this is the this is one statement of one generalized statement of second law of thermodynamics. 
So delta is the change in entropy of the system, and the and this section, this term gives the preferred or natural direction of the energy transfer. But now we we have to know some history of this this second law of generation. How this second law of thermodynamics generated? Why this second law of thermodynamics generated? Much early thermodynamics developed was by driven by practical consideration. For example, building of heat engine and refrigerators. So the original statement of second law of thermodynamics is not so generalized. It is actually somewhat different than that that mentioned earlier. That made the only the statement of second the statement which is given now just now is this the entropy of an Now this is the 
So heat actually uh, received from these heat reservor, accept heat from a heat reservor and produced, so totally produced to work is not feasible. It is the Kelvin Planck statement of second law of thermodynamics. So perpetual machine means if that Kelvin Planck statement is hard to, if heat can accept from hot reservor and can be converted to warm, then a ship can accept heat from ocean, from the water of ocean, they can accept heat and it can move, it can transport. It cannot be feasible. So this type of machine is not feasible, but which will make it up second time doesn't exist. Extracting it and using it to all to the warm would constitute a perfect heat engine forbidden by second law. So sir, it must be wasted. Now we have to know what is psychic process.
reversible expansion isothermal reversible expansion isothermal means temperature is fixed isothermal means temperature is fixed here we assume that temperature is t1 so it is a t1 constant so it is actually heat accepting so it is heat accepting for heat uptake process process so we can draw this is the pv diagram of isothermal diagram isothermal works of the diagram is like that point one to two the temperature is fixed at t1 and the curve is like that so it is isothermal reversible expansion the heat is heat uptake is there and temperature is constant as this is the isothermal process temperature is constant at t1 now next step is adiabatic reversible expansion in adiabatic process no heat absorbed or released so delta q is zero delta q is zero but temperature changes from t1 to t2 t1 to t2 and t2 is always less than t1 because no heat is absorbed no energy absorbed so 2 to 3 and this temperature of this 3.13 is t2 and t2 is always less than t1 the next process is isothermal reversible compression so reverse the adiabatic expansion 2 to 3 q is equal to 0 t1 to t2 isothermal reversible compression So this is the Carnot cycle or Carnot engine. It is a hypothetical engine, idealized thermodynamic cycle consisting four reversible steps using ideal gases. So this is the Carnot cycle. So the efficiency of this Carnot cycle is. Can be 
operating between two same reservoirs. Hardware <coughs> efficiency is independent of the technical details of the heat engine or material used. So it is hypothetical and generalized. So what is heat engine? Heat engine is a machine with two heat reservoirs. Heat is taken from higher temperature reservoir and less heat is emitted to lower temperature reservoir. QH is a heat absorbed by the heat engine from the hot body and W is the work performed by the heat engine on the surroundings. And QC is the heat emitted by the heat engine to the cold body. So this is the heat engine. All real heat engine is like that. Heat engine is machine. Steam engine is the first heat engine. So it is the hot reservoir. It is the cold reservoir. See the machine. So heat is accepted from these hot reservoir and perform some amount of work. Other, other heat is actually wasted and is released to the cold reservoir. So we all really heat engine lose some heat to the environment. So efficiency is W by heat absorbed. That is W by QH. That means QH minus QC is W. So QH minus Q, QC by QH. It is QH. It is QC. So eta is equal to W by QH. So W is equal to QH minus QC by QH. Is 1 minus QC by QH. So this is the application of second law of thermodynamics. And this is used initially for generation of steam engine. Now we have to discuss another example. The case of refrigerator. So what happened in refrigerator? In refrigerator actually heat is accepted from cold reservoir. <coughs> A refrigerator accepts it from colder reservoir and transfers it to the hotter reservoir. So this is the reversal of the heat engine. So we can say refrigerator is the exception, but it is not. So you can say refrigerator is an ex exception because it actually in heat engine it is accepted from hot body, but in case of refrigerator it is accepted from cold body, and then it actually release the heat to the hot body. But in case of refrigerator, actually this is not only the thing a refrigerator does, it uses electrical energy or mechanical energy. So refrigerator is the example of reverse heat engine. A system that can do macroscopic work to extract heat from cold body and exhaust it to the hot body, thus cooling the cold body, which is called refrigerator, and the system operates like a heat engine in reverse. So QC is the heat extracted by refrigerator from cold body, and W is the work performed by refrigerator on the surroundings, and QH is the heat emitted by a refrigerator to a hot body. So it, refrigerator is, this is cold, this is hot. So hot to cold, transfer of heat from hot to cold. You can say this is reverse heat engine. What is the process 
statement for refrigerator. It is not possible to flow heat. It is not possible for heat to flow from cold, colder body to warmer body without any work having been done to accomplish this flow. Energy will not flow spontaneously from a low temperature object to higher temperature object. So no refrigerator, perfect refrigerator is possible in this world, in this universe. So some work has to be done. Some work has to be done for this flow to happen. So some work has to be done to flow this flow to happen. So all real refrigerators requires work to get heat to flow from cold area to warmer area. So efficiency of refrigerator is QC by W. It absorbs from Q cold reservoir to hot reservoir. So efficiency is QC by W. Because heat absorbs from cold reservoir. But no perfect refrigerator possible in this universe. Because the all real refrigerator requires work to get heat to flow from a cold area to warmer area. Spontaneous flow of heat from cold area to hot area would constitute a perfect refrigerator forbidden the second law. But this type of refrigerator not feasible in this real world. Now this is the different, this is different statements of second law of unbalance. Now we will discuss the term which actually quite from second law that is called entropy. <coughs> entropy S. So from a heat engine, from heat engine, first entropy term is actually conceived. For that reason, what is the closest statement of entropy? Entropy is a quantity that tells whether a chemical reaction or physical change can occur spontaneously in an isolated system or not. In 1885, Clausius introduced the function, state function, entropy. Entropy is a state function. So what is the, so as it is the state function, it depends only on the initial and final state, uh, the state of the system. It is extensive property. So entropy is dependent of the, it depends on the mass. Yeah. 
that will be transferred if the process were reversible divided by temperature. This is the Clausius statement. And what is Clausius inequality? Clausius inequality. This Clausius statement of entropy. Definition of entropy. So Clausius inequality is delta S is greater than or equal to zero. This is called Clausius inequality. Evaluated for the process. In the limiting case or reversible case, they become equal. 